Namaskaram. May that victor of obstacles, who after sweeping away the stars with his trunk in the delirious joy of the evening, Lord Ganesha protect you. There is a city in the world, famous under the name of Tamralipta, and in that city there was a very rich merchant named Dhanadatta. And he, being childless, assembled many Brahmins and said to them with due respect, take such steps as will procure me a son soon. The Brahmins, after a sacrificial fee had been promised to them, performed a sacrifice, then a son was born to that merchant. That son was called Gusina, and he gradually grew up to man's estate. Then his father Dhanadatta began to look out for a wife for him. Then his father went with that son of his to another country, on the pretense of traffic, but really to get a daughter-in-law, there he asked an excellent merchant of the name of Dharmagupta to give him his daughter named Devasmita for his son Gusina. But Dharmagupta, who was tenderly attached to his daughter, did not approve of that connection, reflecting that the city of Tamralipta was very far off. But when Devasmita beheld that Guasina, her mind was immediately attracted by his virtues, and she was set on abandoning her relations, and so she made an assignation with him by means of a confidant, and went away from that country at night with her beloved and his father. When they reached Tamralipta they were married, and the minds of the young couple were firmly knit together by the bond of mutual love. Then Guasina's father died, and he himself was urged by his relations to go to the country of Kata'aha for the purpose of trafficking, but his wife Devasmita was too jealous to approve of that expedition, fearing exceedingly that he would be attracted by some other lady. Then, as his wife did not approve of it, and his relations kept inciting him to it, Guasina, whose mind was firmly set on doing his duty, was bewildered. Then he went and performed a vow in the temple of the god, observing a rigid fast, trusting that the god would show him some way out of his difficulty. And his wife Davis Medwa also performed a vow with him, then Shiva was pleased to appear to that couple in a dream and giving them the two red lotuses the god said to them take each of you one of these lotuses in your hand. And if either of you shall be unfaithful during your separation, the lotus in the hand of the other shall fade, but not otherwise. After hearing this, the two woke up, and each beheld in the hand of the other a red lotus, and it seemed as if they had got one another's hearts. Then Guasina set out, lotus in hand, but Devasmita remained in the house with her eyes fixed upon her flower. Guasina for his part quickly reached the country of Kata'aha, and began to buy and sell jewels there. And four young merchants in that country, seeing that unfading lotus was ever in his hand, were greatly astonished. Accordingly they got him to their house by an artifice, and made him drink a great deal of wine, and then asked him the history of the lotus, and he being intoxicated told them the whole story. Then those four young merchants, knowing that Guasina would take a long time to complete his sales and purchases of jewels and other wares, planned together, like rascals as they were, the seduction of his wife out of curiosity, and eager to accomplish it set out quickly for Tamralipta without their departure being noticed. There they cast about for some instrument, and at last had recourse to a female ascetic of the name of Yoga Kirindakaa, who lived in a sanctuary of Buddha, and they said to her in an affectionate manner Reverend Madam, if our object is accomplished by your help, we will give you much wealth. She answered them no doubt, you young men desire some woman in this city, so tell me all about it, I will procure you the object of your desire, but I have no wish for money, I have a pupil of distinguished ability named C.D. Carey, owing to her kindness I have obtained untold wealth. When they heard that they said, procure us an interview with the wife of the merchant Gusina named Davis Smita. When she heard that, the female ascetic undertook to manage that business for them and she gave those young merchants her own house to reside in. Then she gratified the servants at Guasina's house with gifts of sweetmeats and other things, and afterwards entered it with her pupil. Then, as she approached the private rooms of Devasmita, a bitch, that was fastened there with a chain, would not let her come near, but opposed her entrance in the most determined way. Then Devasmita seeing her, of her own accord sent a maid, and had her brought in, thinking to herself, what can this person become for? After she had entered, the wicked ascetic gave Devasmita her blessing, and, treating the virtuous woman with affected respect, said to her. 
I have always had a desire to see you, but today I saw you in a dream, therefore I have come to visit you with impatient eagerness, and my mind is afflicted at beholding you separated from your husband, for beauty and youth are wasted when one is deprived of the society of one's beloved. With this and many other speeches of the same kind she tried to gain the confidence of the virtuous woman in a short interview, and then taking leave of her she returned to her own house. On the second day she took with her a piece of meat full of pepper dust, and went again to the house of Devasmita, and there she gave that piece of meat to the bitch at the door, and the bitch gobbled it up, pepper and all. Then owing to the pepper dust, the tears flowed in profusion from the animal's eyes, and her nose began to run. And the cunning ascetic immediately went into the apartment of Devasmita, who received her hospitably, and began to cry. When Devasmita asked her why she shed tears, she said with affected reluctance, My friend, look at this bitch weeping outside here. This creature recognized me today as having been its companion in a former birth, and began to weep, for that reason my tears gushed through pity. When she heard that, and saw that bitch outside apparently weeping, Devasmita thought for a moment to herself, What can be the meaning of his wonderful sight? Then the ascetic said to her, My daughter, in a former birth, I and that bitch were the two wives of a certain Brahmin. And her husband frequently went about to other countries on embassies by order of the king. Now while he was away from home, I lived with other men at my pleasure, and so did not cheat the elements, of which I was composed. Therefore I have been born in this birth with a recollection of my former existence. But she, in her former life, through ignorance, confined all her attention to the preservation of her character, therefore she has been degraded and born again a one of the canine race, however, she too remembers her former birth. The wise Devasmita said to herself, this is a novel conception of duty, no doubt this woman has laid a treacherous snare for me. And so she said to her, reverend lady for this long time I have been ignorant of this duty, so procure me an interview with some charming man. Then the ascetic said there are residing here some young merchants that have come from another country, so I will bring them to you. When she had said this, the ascetic returned home delighted, and Davis Mead of her own accord said to her maids no, doubt those scoundrelly young merchants, whoever they may be, have seen that unfading lotus in the hand of my husband, and have on some occasion or other, when he was drinking wine, asked him out of curiosity to tell the whole story of it, and have now come here from that island to seduce me and this wicked ascetic is employed by them. So bring quickly some wine mixed with datura, and when you have brought it, have a dog's foot of iron made as quickly as possible. When Devasmita had given these orders, the maids executed them faithfully, and one of the maids, by her orders, dressed herself up to resemble her mistress. The ascetic for her part chose out of the party of four merchants, each of whom in his eagerness said, let me go first, one individual, and brought him with her. And concealing him in the dress of her pupil, she introduced him in the evening into the house of Devasmita, and coming out, disappeared. Then that maid, who was disguised as Devasmita, courteously persuaded the young merchant to drink some of that wine drugged with Datura. That liquor, like his own immodesty, robbed him of his senses, and then the maids took away his clothes and other equipments and left him stark naked, then they branded him on the forehead with the mark of a dog's foot and during the night took him and pushed him into a ditch full of filth. Then he recovered consciousness in the last watch of the night, and found himself plunged in a ditch, as it were the hell of Icky assigned to him by his sins. Then he got up and washed himself and went to the house of the female ascetic, in a state of nature, feeling with his fingers the mark on his forehead. And when he got there, he told his friends that he had been robbed on the way, in order that he might not be the only person made ridiculous. And the next morning he sat with a cloth wrapped round his branded forehead, giving as an excuse that he had a headache from keeping awake so long, and drinking too much. In the same way all the four young merchants suffered in turns branding and other humiliating treatment, though they concealed the fact. And they went away from the place, without revealing to the female ascetic the ill treatment they had experienced, hoping that she would suffer in a similar way. On the next day the ascetic went with her disciple to the house of Devasmita, much delighted at having accomplished what she undertook to do. 
Then Davis Mita received her courteously, and made her drink wine drugged with Datura, offered as a sign of gratitude. When she and her disciple were intoxicated with it, that chaste wife cut off their ears and noses, and flung them also into a filthy pool. And being distressed by the thought that perhaps these young merchants might go and slay her husband, she told the whole circumstance to her mother-in-law. Then her mother-in-law said to her, My daughter, you have acted nobly, but possibly some misfortune may happen to my son in consequence of what you have done. Then Davis Mita said I will go and save my husband by my discretion. So the wise Davis Mita in company with her maids put on the dress of a merchant. Then she embarked on a ship, on the pretense of a mercantile expedition, and came to the country of Kata'aha where her husband was. And when she arrived there, she saw that husband of hers, Gusina, in the midst of a circle of merchants, like consolation in external bodily form. He seeing her afar off in the dress of a man, as it were, drank her in with his eyes, and thought to himself, Who may this merchant be that looks so like my beloved wife? So Davis Mita went and represented to the king that she had a petition to make, and asked him to assemble all his subjects. Then the king full of curiosity assembled all the citizens, and said to that lady disguised as a merchant, What is your petition? Then Davis Mita said there are residing here in your midst four slaves of mine who have escaped, let the king make them over to me. Then the king, said to her, All the citizens are present here, so look at everyone in order to recognize him, and take those slaves of yours. Then she seized upon the four young merchants, whom she had before treated in such a humiliating way in her house, and who had wrappers bound round their heads. Then the merchants, who were there, flew in passion, and said to her, These are the sons of distinguished merchants, how then can they be your slaves? Then she answered them, If you do not believe what I say, examine their foreheads which I marked with a dog's foot. They consented, and removing the head wrappers of these four, they all beheld the dog's foot on their foreheads. Then all the merchants were abashed, and the king, being astonished, himself asked Davis Mita what all this meant. She told the whole story, and all the people burst out laughing, and the king said to the lady, They are your slaves by the best of titles. Then the other merchants paid a large sum of money to that chaste wife, to redeem those four from slavery, and to find to the king's treasury. Davis Mita received that money, and recovered her husband, and being honored by all good men, returned then to her own city Tamralipta, and she was never afterwards separated from her beloved. Thus, women of good family ever worship their husbands with chaste and resolute behavior, and never think of any other man, for to virtuous wives the husband is the highest deity. Hope you had an opportunity to learn something new today. Let us reconnect in another interesting blog post. Danya Vadim